Welcome to the Museum at FIT's Fashion Culture Online Series. My name is Tania Melendez Escalante, and I am Senior Curator of Education and Public Programs. It is my honor to introduce Jennifer Lizot, who will examine how secondhand goods sold at thrift stores, flea markets, and garage sales came to be both profitable and culturally influential. She traces the origins and meanings of secondhand style and explores how buying pre-owned clothing went from a signifier of poverty to a declaration of rebellion. Jennifer will speak in conversation with MFIT curator, Colleen Hill. Enjoy the show. Hi everyone, I'm so thrilled to be speaking to Jennifer Lazat today, the author of From Goodwill to Grunge. And Jennifer, I am really thrilled to speak with you about this book, which I read a few years ago and thought was absolutely brilliant, both in the depth of research and also in the very clear and really interesting way that you explain this incredibly complex history. Uh, I referenced this book again when I was recently writing my book on 1990s fashion. You truly do the best coverage of grunge fashion I've ever read, and we'll talk a little bit about that today. Um, but if we can start with speaking about Kurt Cobain and one of my favorites, which is the uh, Nirvana MTV Unplugged session from 1993. Sure. Thanks, Colleen. That's uh, terrific. It's always gratifying that uh, people have interpreted your work as generously as you have. Um, yes, uh, this cardigan is really a good example of, I think, something that was a very self-conscious use of uh, referencing the meaning of clothing uh, that Kurt Cobain did, right? So uh, cardigans are themselves kind of a classic piece of apparel, right? They can be used in a lot of ways, but it kind of signifies um, conservative uprightness and so forth. But he's kind of flipping the script and using it in a, in a, in a different way. He's wearing you know, like a pilled part mohair kind of uh obviously visibly secondhand one that is uh, gender ambiguous, right? It might be a woman's sweater, it might be a man's sweater. Um, I always thought it was a woman's sweater, but then I actually learned that the buttons are on the man's sweater side. So it is was originally intended to be a male sweater. Um, but he's layering it too in sort of ways with that perfectly kind of out of style, mid eighties button up shirt and a feminist punk band screened t-shirt. Uh, and just the whole look together is kind of the summit of grunge in a lot of ways in its various references and ambiguities. And of course, this was one of his last appearances before he took his own life a few months later. And I think this sweater as objects sometimes do, but especially in the context of grunge clothing um, took on sort of more epic qualities. And then by I think 2012 sold for $334,000 in auction. Um, and I love the way they list the uh, sweater in auction because they list all its imperfections, uh, like the cigarette burn hole in the left pocket and stuff like that, which of course was part of its appeal and cachet in the context of Kurt Cobain and Nirvana. And I loved that you described the full ensemble too, because I have to admit during the 90s, I had a VHS recording of this performance. I still absolutely love this performance. I listen to it regularly even now. Um, and I would usually share it with my best friend who did not have MTV. It replayed on MTV all the time. So I could usually catch it. Um, but a friend of mine didn't have it. So I'd always give her the VHS. I wish I still had it. Um, but the cardigan is what always stood out to me as the quintessential thing that Kurt was wearing. Um, but I love that you really kind of dissected it. I didn't even think about this Frightwig t-shirt, for example. So just thinking a little bit more deeply about the full look was really helpful as well. Uh, and then we'll talk about Kurt and his dresses a little closer to the end of the talk, if that's okay. Of course, yeah. And one of the things that I loved about your book and thought was so fascinating was that it can't have been 
a straightforward fashion history book in the way that you research things, because this is often a history that hasn't been well covered. And I know you said that you went into the Salvation Army archives. Is that correct? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. In Alexandria, Virginia. Yep. Fantastic. <laughs> and you found out quite a bit about this fascinating figure, Evangeline Booth, if you can tell us a little bit about her. Yeah, one thing that I really love about dress and fashion as a historical topic and secondhand specifically is it kind of blows up all the binaries that historians like to maintain. Like um, this is an example of how fashion is business and it is charity is, you know, um, a whole bunch of other things and also how distribution and producers are also consumers and users of secondhand objects and clothing, right? So there's there's all the categories get kind of bundled up together, which is exactly why this couldn't have been a straightforward business history or a straightforward fashion history because they relied on each other to sort of build into uh, the fashionability and popularity of secondhand. Yeah, so Evangeline Booth was the youngest child of the founders of Salvation Army, founded in England in the 1860s and came to America. Evangeline Booth came to America in the 1890s and became the US general. Okay, so the Salvation Army has this sort of paramilitary um, structure. And they also come to have their uniforms, which the first of them was all cobbled together out of secondhand clothing, which they had donated as part of their business and charitable organization, right? So they would kind of just put on anything that suggested a uniform, a sailor's hat, uh, you know, you know, a, a, a uniform coat, a policeman's um, belt, anything that kind of looked like a uniform until they started making their own uniforms. Um, and here you see some examples of how Salvation Army Slum Sisters really kind of used that dressing down side of secondhand fashionability that becomes prominent during grunge and in periods before in the 50s and 60s as well. Um, so slum sisters were um, salvationists who would go into parts of cities where incidentally middle class and upper middle class women usually weren't approved to go into, you know, it wouldn't have been, wouldn't have been considered respectable. Um, and they would do that in order to proselytize, evangelize to uh, poor people living there, but also to help them and give them advice and guidance and sometimes, you know, live among them. And these were called slum sisters. And what I think is just amazing is how they always describe in Salvation Army, the war cry was their kind of uh, journal vehicle for um, communication. And they would describe how they were dressed in these, you know, torn calico dresses um, very romantically. So they clearly have an understanding, Salvationists, of the romance of poverty as expressed through clothing. And so they would dress, they would do this sort of cross-class performative dress in order to go hang out in the tenement slums. And Evangeline Booth herself performed this on Carnegie Hall stage in 1906. And the descriptions in the New York Times of how she dressed, you know, a broken heel on her shoe and, you know, a tartan shawl over her beautiful auburn hair, you know, so she is performing poverty. She's performing several things, poverty, but also the charitable, you know, uh, impulse of her organization. But she also really loves to be the center of attention. So she's using secondhand clothing to perform something about her beliefs. So I really see this great continuity between that performance on stage at Carnegie Hall in 1906 and the 1993 MTV Unplugged um, uh, performance of Nirvana. And they're staging very similar things to get for very different reasons, but in order to send a message out to their audience about their own worth or their organizations or bands meaning. That is so fascinating. I love that connection that you made. And Evangeline Booth was someone that I wasn't at all familiar with prior to reading your book. And in fact, despite the fact that I went to the Salvation Army probably every week, every other week as a teenager to purchase my own secondhand clothes during the 90s, mm -hmm. um, I didn't know anything about its history. So I think this was really fascinating. And that kind of 
contradiction you mentioned about her life uh, in the way that she performed poverty, but in her personal life was, of course, quite wealthy. Yes. Yes. And, you know, she would even, you know, veer away from the rules of salvationists where they were supposed to be dressing in uniforms to show their modesty and exception from the fashionable world. But she would have her uniform lined with expensive French silk. She's very aware of fashion and, and luxury. So she's none of this is unintentional. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So interesting. Ah, and this was such a fascinating story, and I don't know if I'm going to say her name correctly, but Elsa von Lornhoven Freytag, close enough. <laughs> um, she's someone that I had read a bit about uh, in the past, just a bit, uh, but I think you make a really great point in that she actually had quite a significant impact on both art and fashion, and like so many women, is rarely given enough credit. So maybe you can talk both about her style and also about this link to Marcel Duchamp and the fountain. Great, yeah. So I, I, I chose this slide because to me it represents how much fashion intersects with so many other cultural, you know, mediums, right? Whether it's music, like with grunge, right? Which is sort of a term that's synonymous with both the style and the sound or um, with art. And in the 19 teens and 20s, surrealism also kind of had this slipstream involvement, whether it's literature, art, or fashion, right? And uh, Elsa von Loring Hoven Freitag, or just the Baroness, you may call her, as many people did, um, was, you know, a, 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 a poor immigrant when she came to this country, but she is totally eccentric, especially when it comes to her dressing habits. Um, the first kind of uh, evidence of her in this country is a, is a, is a headline that says she's, she's been arrested for cross-dressing. Um, so she really liked to push the boundaries. And she would wear the craziest things, just trash she found on the street, a birdcage as a hat or a necklace. She'd shave her head and dye it vermilion. And she got in with a group of surrealists um, living in New York in Greenwich Village, and she was an artist's model, right? Um, and, and I do think there's this like whole great unwritten history of the role of artist models in some of these that have to do with their, you know, sideline because of sexism. And a lot of them were themselves artists. She produced great works of art and poetry herself that are starting to get a little more acknowledged and recognized by art historians and, and literary scholars. Um, but really she was amused to a lot of them. And so she and Marcel Duchamp were good friends. And um, it is now thought by some art scholars that she may have even, she may deserve at least partial credit for um, the famous fountain, um, which, you know, start, sort of starts this movement of found art where you sort of get it out of context. And she does this with clothing all the time too, by like wearing a car tail light as uh, on her butt and, you know, using found objects to dress herself. Um, but it's thought that she may have actually sent him the urinal uh, because one of her nicknames also was our mutt. So this may be better thought of as a collaborative piece for her. Um, but I, I really think that she is a missing page in this history that connects how secondhand became fashionable, became, um, you know, visu visu visibly secondhand things became a statement uh, because she just always dressed in found objects, secondhand things, stolen things. <laughs> um, she loved to wear um, Curtain, uh, cur like curtain circles, what are those called? Oh, curtain rings? Curtain rings. Right. She loved to wear curtain rings that she had absconded with from department stores as bracelets, for example. So that's sort of, uh, um, you know, rebellious dress that was very much uh, celebration, right? She was very joyful in the way that she dressed. And she also did that in order to pose as a, um, as uh, artist model and inspire a lot of famous surrealist artists of the time. So I think that there's an unspoken link between like her and Elsa Scarparelli, for example, right? And, and their experimentalism and their use of sort of um, objects as art and fashion. Absolutely. And I love that you described her as dressing Dada. I just thought that was the most straightforward, excellent way to explain her style. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Oh, and I love this uh, story about Fanny Bryce because many people may be familiar with the song The Secondhand Rose, particularly because of the Barbara Streisand connection, but can you tell us about its origins and Fanny Bryce and a little bit about her role as a New Yorker and secondhand fashion? Yeah, sure. Um, what, what I really like about this is um, it's 1921, 1922, the song Secondhand Rose becomes a big hit. First, Fanny Bryce performs it in the Ziegfeld Follies, a big review in New York, right, on the stage. And then it becomes a record and it's it sells very well. Um, but what I like about it is this is sort of alongside Dada and surrealism. This is a transitional moment for secondhand and its acceptance and destigmatization among some, right? So it's a growth, um, the first glimmers of secondhand clothing and stuff becoming, uh, having a broader audience of voluntary consumers, we, should, we could say. But it also gets at some of the reasons why it was stigmatized, and that has to do with Americans' history of anti-Semitism. So like in the 19th century, most people who dealt in secondhand clothes were Jewish peddlers who had these push carts, right? And this is a history that comes from Europe where the Jewish diaspora were kept out of a lot of lucrative professions. So they would do things like sell secondhand clothing on sidewalks. And this transferred to New York and Chicago and other big cities in the United States. So there was this stereotype and stigma against buying secondhand because it's associated with uh, Jewish population. So anti-Semitism plays a role in stigmatizing this. But by the 1920s, there's more acceptance of Jewish immigrants um, and second generations, especially of Jewish immigrants are starting to achieve uh, more social status and, and wealth. And at the same time, there's this greater acceptance of secondhand. So the song that she performs and her, her uh, birth name is Fanny Borach, and she's definitely a Jew. Her parents were Jewish immigrants, and the the way that she performed this song and its lyrics indicate a Jewish background, right? Uh, where she lives, um, you know, the fact that her dad was a secondhand dealer, right? So all the all the lyrics are, um, you know, I'm secondhand rose, everything I wear is secondhand, my dad owns a secondhand store, our piano is secondhand, even my man's been married before. So there are all of this, there's all this um, sort of hidden context, first of all, of a Jewish background, not so hidden if you ever hear Fanny Bryce perform because she plays up this very stereotypically Jewish accent. Um, so the thing that I find, find interesting about the song is at the end, she's called out, she goes to the Ritz and she's wearing this fur coat and somebody says, hey, that used to be my fur coat, but it's okay. She doesn't get like, it, nothing horrible happens to her. Whereas there's like a um, earlier cautionary tales like from Saturday Evening Post in the 1880s where a girl buys the secondhand dress and ends up giving um, uh, yellow fever or some terrible communicable disease to her whole family. <laughs> yes. It's clearly <laughs> becoming a little less stigmatized by the 1920s. And Fanny Bryce shows that as well as that link between fashion and secondhand and music. Yeah. And I think that's what makes it so interesting is that we're starting to see secondhand uh, clothing and pop popular culture come together. And so again, it's sort of bringing us full circle to our first slide and grunge, uh, but it's really fascinating how you've traced that history. And I have I was familiar with this song, but the uh, depth of research behind it is really, really fascinating to me. And also your look at Jack Kerouac, uh, both his khakis, and I remember this gaff ad, which is so fantastic, uh, but also how secondhand dress is worked into his books, which I have to admit, I have not read in a long time. Um, but maybe you can tell us a little bit about uh, both his personal style and sort of his ethos and beliefs and also how he works secondhand dress into his novels. Sure. Well, so we start to see the emergence of secondhand through things like Fanny Bryce and surrealism in the 1920s, but all of that kind of stops seemingly in the 1930s and 40s because of the Great Depression and rationing during World War II. That might seem counterintuitive, 
but there's actually just not enough supply of secondhand goods because people keep their stuff. So people keep their stuff and they keep wearing it. And then right after the end of World War II, everybody has like their, not everybody, but many people have their war bonds. There's all this new synthetic fabrics, new fashions. So people aren't really invested in secondhand for a generation or so. But then you see the emergence of um, a generation of middle class baby boomers mostly, right? Maybe a little earlier, Jack Kerouac and his lot are a little pre-baby boomers, but nonetheless, they grew up in middle-class households um, and part of their inclination towards the working class and poverty is they believe that there's you know, strength and beauty and um, everything belongs to me because I am poor is a quote that Jack Kerouac works into two or three of his works. Um, and it, it, there's a clearly a expression of solidarity with the working class, right, who have had to really work with their hands and do things like that. And the impoverished, including, you know, um, the minority citizens like uh, the, the Beats lauded Black jazz musicians and really wanted to express solidarity also with um, Black Americans. Uh, and, and Jack Kerouac uh, writes in um, On the Road repeatedly about clothing as disheveled as beat, right? The term beat actually can be correlated to the fashion, right? Dressing in a beat way. Um, other famous like poets and um, writers talk even about goodwill and shopping at second hand and sort of lionize second hand or wearing clothes repeatedly, right? So Jack Kerouac and his khakis, there's whole myths built up around like, he, did he have a single pair of khakis that he wore all the time? No, of course he didn't. But there's this kind of idea that he wore the same khakis over and over again. And there's, there's beauty in that. And there's beauty in, in, in sort of wearing something out. And then of course, we see that reflected in the 90s ethos and the 90s ideology of kind of, well, frankly, middle-class kids dressing like they're poor to some extent, right? And so look, Kerouac wore khakis. It's simple, but there's so much layered in that ad and when it came out that really reflects the evolution of voluntary secondhand, even though it's an ad for a, you know, a, a, a firsthand outlet, it's still, kind of referencing, these are going to be your pants, you're going to wear them forever, and they're going to be like your signature. And you're going to be as cool as Kerouac doing it. And what I find really interesting is that I've noticed that the secondhand market now, uh, there's a lot of 90s gap. And 90s gap was like the ultimate, it was something I could never afford at that time as a kid. Um, but they had great clothes. And I've seen quite a bit of that. Uh, on secondhand sites as a sort of lauded style and great time in Gap's history. So it's really interesting to see this ad again as well. Yeah, that's true. That's true. It's all over Depop, I guess now. Mm -hmm, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and the return of the raccoon coat is a multi-layered and really fascinating story. And what I love about this is that it essentially has a clear point of origin, uh, if you can explain that to us. Yeah, I really love this story because if it is the, you know, or origin stories hardly ever have a, it's so fuzzy the beginning, but I really think that Sue Saltzman and the Saltzmans can, uh, you can trace the first kind of use, popular broader use of vintage as applied to clothing to this couple who lived in Greenwich Village. And they were by no means poor. They She shopped at Salvation Army as a fashionable thing. She loved the 20s, so she loved to look for like old cloche hats or anything that was redolent of the 20s and the kind of, um, you know, uh, um, party atmosphere and, uh, um, you know, wealth and luxury of that era. There really is some, you know, uh, affinity between the 1950s and the 1920s. And you see this come again with fashion in the 1980s, right? Those recurrent trends, but a lot of them have to do with levels of wealth. But the story about the raccoon fur coats, um, the Saltzmans are having a party and Sue Saltzman mentions, oh, I was, at Salve I was at Goodwill today and I saw this 1920s raccoon fur coat and I was thinking about it too hard and I turned around and it was gone. And a, a student of her husband's, uh, who, is a, who is an architecture professor at Parsons, uh, says, oh, I have some of those because my dad 
owned uh, a boys and men's department store in the 1920s. And what happened was raccoon fur was extremely popular for a few years in the late 1920s, like Red and Grange wore them. And they were very, it was very Ivy League for young men to wear these floor length raccoon fur coats. Then the Great Depression happened and basically department stores are left holding a bag, right? They have hundreds of these raccoon fur coats and they just leave them moldering in department stores. And so this young man says, I can get you dozens of these raccoon fur coats. And incidentally, he knows about them because just a couple of years before that, there was, um, let me think. Was it Davy Crockett? Thank you. I don't know why I spaced it. So a couple of years before that, Davy Crockett was a popular uh, um, Disney movie and series. And so kids went nuts over the coonskin hat. And so all of these uh, department store owners who had these moldering piles of raccoon fur coats cut them up into raccoon fur uh, hats, right? So a lot of them were actually gone, but the Saltzmans sort of went into business and went around buying up all these raccoon fur coats and reselling them. And it gets to the point that um, I think the next slide will show this. In, in, in 1950, oh, no, that's showing, so that this is Red Grange and the popularity of it in the 1920s, right? It was on the cover of Saturday Evening Post, uh, and so it was a big fad among Ivy League men. But to go back to 1957, the next slide will show you, I think, this magazine, or the next one will, this magazine that talks about uh, how this is in Life magazine that talks about the trend in 1957 of the Saltzman selling these old raccoon fur coats to Lord and Taylor and all these department stores who put it in the collegian section. And an interesting thing about it is this was in the 1950s, a fad for young women, Ivy League women to wear. So they are cross-dressing basically, even though it doesn't appear to be that because these were young men's clothes. Um, but then, the way that they're marketed in the 1950s is for women. And I like this Macy's ad here. Old raccoons don't fade away. They reappear at Macy's for 2209 and go to college all over again, right? So there's a very self-conscious repeating. And here you also see the word vintage and modern styles in raccoon look contemporary. So after all these coats sell out, um, mainstream distributors try to produce new raccoon fur items and it doesn't catch on. It's only the vintage 1920s versions that young college kids want. And so it's short lived because there are only about 400 of the coats that the Saltzmans can find, but they are farmed out to all the lucky collegians who can grab them from Macy's and Lord and Taylor in that one season. So I, I just think that's a really interesting way in which secondhand went travels the corridors of fashion, right? From a party to a very limited kind of colloquial use to expanding all the way to national department stores. It's so interesting. And do we see, is that bag that that woman is carrying made of raccoon too? I know you talk about how when the really good cash of raccoon fur coats is used up, there's this also a push to sell other accessories, which also doesn't really catch on. Exactly. So the, what you see in the middle is like, oh, these are the things we really want to sell. I know you guys are really into whatever, you know, Lord and Taylor sold at the college shop and these old, but yeah. So this is Life Magazine reporting on this fad, right? In September of, of 1957. And this is the tail end of it because they can't find any more of those genuine 1920s coats, which they also market as kind of like, in one of them, we found a list of speakeasies. And in another, you know, they, they try to really, you can imagine the like, call it Ivy League, um, you know, great Gatsby parties where people want to show up in these fur coats. <laughs> yes, yeah. And I love that we actually have uh, a 20s raccoon fur coat in our collection um, awesome. that we've used a couple of times. It's, and who knows, I mean, it may have been worn again in the 60s for all we know. I wish I had more of its history, but it's such a cool thing. That's great. <laughs> So this is my absolute favorite era in fashion in general and the time period that uh, inspired me to become a fashion historian, but also inspired me to go through thrift shops as a kid. Uh, so could you introduce us to how vintage fashion really begins to take off 
during the 60s and into the 70s and also tell us about some of the main players in that. Yeah, so I I love this coupled with the stories about the beats and the beatniks, right? This really illustrates the sort of class conflicts that vintage has always had, right? There's this idea that it's breaking down the classes because it's all about creativity and you can just find and wear whatever suits you. you. But it, it's of course much more complex than that. So in the starting in the late 1950s, but really emerging in the 1960s, you've got this group of London aristocrats, really young partying um, noble men and women who loved to thrift shop all around the world, right? We're talking dream thrift shopping, like Morocco <laughs> and Marché aux Pousse in Paris and so forth. And they basically start to curate collections of Victorian and Edwardian, especially clothing. And I, I really think that there's a lot more exploring that historians can do as to like the meaning of this, because a lot of it is critiquing British colonialism, right? And just uh, looking at the diverse influences in this period, which is, you know, sort of the, the end of the British empire in some ways, right? Victorian and Edwardian, and the sort of performativity of class that went along with dress in that era in the United States, but particularly in Great Britain. And so you see a lot of patterns being coveted and lush fabrics, right? One reason I think vintage clothing and really high quality Edwardian and uh, Victorian dress catches on in this period is that if you go mainstream shopping in the 50s and 60s, you're going to get a lot of um, very wearable, practical, durable materials. This is the age of synthetics, right? From the 50s to the 70s, there's a lot of experimenting with synthetics. And there is something somewhat of a, a, a pushback against that and almost like a, 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 a little bit of a snobbish, right? Sort of, I'm no, I'm gonna go back to really hard to maintain velvet <laughs> and and lace and the stuff that you can, you know, barely touch without ripping. Because if anything shows my status, it's the fact that I can dress like this, right? It means I don't have to have a straight job. It means I don't have to like um, if anything, it's showing off their class and status in society, but in a way that's very fun, very creative, and very rebellious against the stodginess of aristocracy as it still remained and retained in Great Britain. And there is also gender deviance here. So there's something called the peacock movement, right, in men's dress which you can probably figure out what that means by what it said, right? Which kind of harkens back to pre-French revolution when aristocratic men were the peacocks of the human species, right? They were the ones who wore beautiful colors and layers and layers of patterns and really dressed it up. And so you see a couple of examples of that here, men wearing florals, men wearing brocade, men wearing lush fabrics and bright colors and you know a lot of a lot of designers and invested fashion industry interests wanted to make the stick for many reasons because it's beautiful frankly but also because then men maybe would buy more than just their one three-piece dark suit <laughs> if they had more novelty it was more novelty driven but it didn't stick for the most part, though, of course, I argue that men have a lot of different ways to still retain their peacock status and dress, so. And it's coming back a little bit. I think at least in, in cities like New York, I see men dressing in more extravagant, colorful, interesting ways um, in the past five years or so, which I absolutely love. Yes, I really hope that that needs to be just commonly incorporated in men's fashion. Agreed. Well, yes. <laughs> Uh, and one of my favorites, I was Lord Kitchener's ballot. I'll say it in the English way. Um, if you can tell us about this very essential store. Well, this is part of the same generation of uh, globe trotting uh, curators of fashion and goods. Um, on In Chelsea and Portobello Road, you would get a lot of these, um, some of these wealthy curators or people who weren't so wealthy, but just into the fashion of it, you know, Angela McRobbie, 
famously writes about the, the the British literary critic about secondhand starting among fashion designers who are poor in London. So there's this admixture of aristocrats and poor fashion designers, and they're really both using secondhand. And you start to see um, flea market stalls and shops opening that are featuring very highly curated secondhand clothing, right? And so this is the difference between really what makes a vintage shop, right? And like Goodwill or Salvation Army, which has become more curated over the years, but not nearly to the extent of something like Iowa's Lord Kitchener's Valet, right? Where they are um, famous for, as you can see up there, their sort of British colonial wardrobe, right? So military hussar uniforms, um, that are mostly used in mocking ways, right? And so they were pretty countercultural and they really did piss off a lot of people with the kind of wares and the way that they carried them and sold them. Which was definitely part of the appeal, right? Yes, <laughs> yes, there, there, was, there was no, no, no getting around the, why young people were dressing this way, right? In the US and Great Britain and wherever else, or older people. <laughs> <laughs> And I know that um, I was Lord Kitchener's valet also got a lot of attention after, certainly after Mick Jagger started wearing the styles. I think it was on Ready, Steady, Go. Was that yep, it? Exactly. Yep, yep, yep. In, in 1966, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And then, of course, we see Jimi Hendrix wearing a fantastic style. Um, is this from the store as well or just in that vein? I, you know, I couldn't find evidence. I know Jimi Hendrix shopped there, but I couldn't connect this exact coat to it. But it seems likely it's at least from one of the Chelsea or, or Portobello Road stores around that time, King's Row. Um, and uh, and also, of course, there's Sgt. Pepper Lonely Hearts Club, Lo Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Heart Club Band. The cover of that album is all, if not from I Was Lord Kitchener's Valet, another similar store on King's Row. Um, yeah, so this definitely is responsible for spreading it not only across the English youth, but to the United States, right? So the style, this love of vintage and Victorian and Edwardian hops over and really becomes influential in the United States. And US, of course, US youth take their own twists on it. They um, There's bands like the Charlatans in the 1960s who really go the Edwardian, like cowboy and Indian route to sort of play up the Americana of these styles. So um, there are twists that US hippies and vintage lovers put on it, but really you gotta give credence to, to the, the, the London scene. And this is uh, Christopher Gibbs, who is one of those aristocrats, right? He went to Eton School. He got kicked out of it. You know, he's a little rebellious nobleman. And uh, he just loved collecting. He had his own vintage antique shop that he opened up. And um, but he really loved fashion. And he knew he was um, part of a movement. Right. And I really like what he had to say about it, because there was lots of conversation among the heavy hitters in this movement, right? The aristocrats who are hanging out with, with rock stars uh, in London and who talk about, you know, well, I just, you know, I, I don't like to be above it all and part of my noble class, but he admits that, no, this takes work and privilege actually to dress like this. And his quote is, you had to be monumentally narcissistic and have time on your hands and just about enough money to do it. It's also not cheap to, you know, buy an old Paul, Paul Poiret coat or something like that. And so he ends up sort of as uh, the uh, spokesperson for this peacock revolution for peacock movement among men's dressers. There's for a short time, a men in Vogue magazine, I think about four years. And he he's one of the fashion, major fashion editors um, in the late 1960s. And he goes on to just have, sell his own, have his own shop and sell his own Items, but mostly he's traveling around the world and collecting things for his aristocratic friends and himself. <laughs> yeah, he's such a fascinating figure. I, I adore this quote. And one of my favorite things that you wrote about him was that he was credited with wearing the first flares in London. Is that right? And as yeah. early as 1961, which I just thought was really fascinating. Of course, I, you can't tell with him how much is he, he is credited or he credits himself. <laughs> With since he was, you know, he had a voice in fashion, and that's something that's important about this. And and Jane Ormsby Gore, who we'll talk about in a second, is it, they are tastemakers. They are in the fashion industry, so it's not just that 
fashion industry is reflecting the sort of organic popularity, they're working from within, you know, they're, they're connected. So, and the same thing happens with grunge. So that's why I think this is especially relevant to those developments between, I mean, again, you see that overlap between fashion and music with Mick Jagger and Jimi Hendrix and the United States, Janis Joplin and other groups. Absolutely. Let's talk about Jane. Yeah. So Jane Ormsby Gore, she dated Mick Jagger supposedly once, Lady Jane, right? He wrote a song about her and she was another, you know, aristocratic youth. She and her brothers and sisters are credited with kind of breaking the mold of the propriety of young noble men and women. Um, They didn't play by the rules. You know, they had this extreme privilege, wealth, and they wanted to have fun with it. They partied a lot. They did a lot of drugs and they shopped a lot. And so Jane Ormsby Gore is the one though, who in interviews always kind of makes me cringe because she's always like, you know, I just want to transcend the the oppression of my class, right? I always long not to be contained within my class. So this is why she buys secondhand clothing because she doesn't want to be, you know, stymied and stifled by her nobility. Um, And, but if you look, if you analyze even this outfit that she's wearing when she was featured in the UK Vogue magazine in 1966, it, it's it's not something that anybody could acquire. <laughs> this coat is a, a, um, a coat that she got on Portobello Road that was, is by Paul Poiré. And this is, that's exceptional for a few reasons. It probably cost a bit, but not nearly as much as it would today, of course. But Paul Poiré is only emerging at this point from um, near obscurity, right? He's super popular in the 1920s and 30s, but when he dies in 1944, he's basically poor and forgotten. So even just her having this article in her collection shows that she's very connected in the fashion world. She's very avant-garde. The hat that she's wearing is a motoring hat uh, from Edward and motoring hat that belonged to her great grandmother, which is such a class thing, right? How many people's great grandmothers would have had an Edwardian motoring hat? Because not many people had Edwardian cars, right? So even just her unawareness that owning an article like this clearly shows her class heritage. And then, you know, like her belt, or the cream silk shirt she got on a trip to Marche of Pouste, which of course not everybody can afford to go on international shopping trips and um, all this. So every element of her clothing kind of shows, and of course, just the fact that she can dress like that shows a certain amount of privilege that she doesn't have a job where she has to conform to certain ideals of professionalism. Exactly, very likely not taking the tube to Vogue every day and that sort of thing. I always think about being on public transit in various outfits and certainly shoes are a factor as well. Absolutely, yeah. Next slide, please. Oh, and the coquettes are such a fascinating story that again, although I'd seen lots of photographs, um, I didn't know much about their history. And I think if you can specifically talk, well, give us a little history and also specifically talk about the MGM sale, which I just love that story. That would be fantastic. I think uh, uh, one of those cases of historical jealousy that you're just like, ah, I want to be there. Um, so this is an illustration of what um, of, of cross gender dress, but where it gets kind of very playful and hippie ish and um, becomes dubbed gender fuck. Right. So it's not always just men dressing as women, uh, as you can see here. Right. Here's some men with clownish makeup, but they've still got facial hair and everyone has long hair or short hair or wears whatever they want, you know, a skirt, but they're not shaving their legs. They're mixing up all the gender cues. And the Cockettes were a performing hippie performance troupe that uh, involved um, a young man who became known as Hibiscus, who came from New York City. And his first kind of renown, I guess, if you know that famous Vietnam uh, peace photo where he's putting so a young man is putting a flower in the in the butt of a gun in the mm-hmm. rifle of it, I guess, yeah. And um, it was in probably Life magazine. That was Hibiscus before he traveled out west to become a performer. And so he's a very garrulous, uh, uh, expressive man. He's not pictured here because I want to kind of a group photo. The Cockettes evolve into this performing troupe that just 
are kind of chaotic and make fun of everything, but they're best known for the way that they dress. And they go secondhand shopping. That is their MO. They all live together with like, at one point with John Waters, right? Of, of, of trash film fame and divine from they said everybody is in the coquettes at one point or another it seems mm -hmm. and they all go second shopping and they make an art out of it and they use secondhand shopping to buck gender norms because if you think about it department stores are very rigidly organized to tell you based on age goals profession sex etc where you should get your clothing <laughs> and secondhand stores it's not so neatly organized they do usually you know conventionally try to separate sexes but it's very telling that you can find men's shirts and women's sections and women's clothes and men's sections right and nobody's going to stop you um this is in the day when it was illegal to dress in clothes of the opposite sex right you could get arrested san francisco and elsewhere and you could get arrested just for shopping for cross cross dressers would try to go shopping at macy's and end up getting arrested you can't try on the clothes of the opposite sex but secondhand stores are much less policed so this is one reason why um, gender nonconformists are shopping at second hand, plus cost, plus variety, et cetera. And also, you know, begin to use them as forms of fundraising to sell their clothing. So this, it, again, the buyer becomes the seller, becomes, you know, it, those, those veins really get encircled and entwined. Um, oh, and then, yes, so there's an MGM purging of all their old, um uh clothing and costumes from the 1920s to the night through the 1960s and um a few of members of the coquettes get in on it early they hear about it and so they get to go and just see you know like janet lee's green dress from gone with the wind all, any all the famous you know ruby slippers and you know reams and reams of gorgeous crazy chorus girl stuff from MGM Studios. And so they they get to be able to kind of be the first shoppers for that big sale and buy a lot of those crazy outfits. And they also like do things like steal trunks from uh, uh, um, opera houses from, I think Shanghai Opera House left their trunks once and they just politely didn't tell them and took some of their costumes. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Real scavenging. They are. And some members of them went on to, you know, like costume glam bands. And I really see the Coquettes as having a heritage that goes far beyond and again extends to this kind of slipstring between secondhand and music. Um, and like the New York Dolls, one member of the Coquettes ends up being their kind of uh, costumer. And so they, they have a really wide, uh, sneaky kind of influence, sort of like the Baroness, right? So these kind of untold stories that get in everywhere. <laughs> and I was really fascinated by your uh, look into Patti Smith's wardrobe, because I think like many people, I've always viewed her and her look uh, as a sort of feminist icon. And you proved me wrong <laughs> alongside many other people by actually reading what Patti Smith herself was saying and who she was looking to for influence. I mean, to be fair, that shocked me. I went in on, I went in on my research prepared to, you know, lionize her as this feminist, uh, you know, and, and, and she is still a feminist, but her intentions in wearing the clothing was really to become part of a boys club, right? She was joining this, she was very, very much wanting to be a list of her male uh, idols, right? From, you know, Rimbaud to Baudelaire to Jean Genet, who's pictured there. And so if you look at what she said about uh, this outfit that she wore, of course, that um, uh, Robert Maplethorpe took the photo of her for, for the cover of Horses, um, she's referencing to several of her male heroes. She wants to be part of the boys club. And she even says things like, you know, I, when I wear something that I, I imagine a man wore, I'm just imagining he's my boyfriend, you know? She's very, there's a kind of strange heterosexual crushiness um, that she herself says uh, informs her stylistic development. Which, I mean, I kind of relate to that very, it's it's very relatable, it's very understandable, but it's different from what I thought it meant. 
-hmm. So here she says that she chose this shirt because she was thinking of a famous portrait by of Jean Genet by the famous Hungarian photographer Brassai. And you, you, you maybe can't see it, but he's got his sleeves rolled up. So she bought this, uh, she wore this white shirt, which she bought at the Salvation Army and cut the sleeves off because it reminded her of that photograph. And um, Robert Maplethorpe asked her to take her coat off uh, and so she could, so he could see the, you know, white starkness of the men's shirt underneath. And she threw it over her shoulder because she thought it was like Frank Sinatra, who she also loves. So she's posing here as several of her male icons. Um, and I mean, th that doesn't mean that's not feminist. It's just, uh, it, it's breaching the boundaries with a different meaning behind it. So that's why I talk about it as like the boyfriend look, right? Which is still a term that uh, resonates in fashion world and industry and even, you know, new designs, right? Boyfriend cut jeans were really big. And I guess that was that the aughts? <laughs> I think so. Yeah, it all blends <laughs> together when you get to a <laughs> It does. Um, and so, and of course, this is somewhat similar to like Annie Hall style, right? Where she's really, is it empowering for her to wear what she is or is it making her even more gamine and small because it's so overwhelming and large to her? It's kind of up to interpretation. Yeah, and I have to admit, I, I've i read her autobiography and I know a decent amount about her, but I'd never really thought about hers in relation to secondhand dress. I'm like, well, of course she wasn't going to Macy's and buying these white shirts. That makes perfect sense, both because she is who she is and again, because of uh, financial reasons. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a monogram on this shirt that I thought was really interesting too, that you dug up that little detail. Um, so yeah, on, on that shirt that she chose out, again, she had apparently a whole stack of Salvation Army white men's shirts. So her choices are very intentional here. And there's a monogram there that, you know, nobody buying her album is maybe even going to be able to discern, but it says RV. She doesn't know who that was, but she imagined it as belonging to the director, Roger Vadim, who directed um, uh, uh, Barbarella in 1968 which is not a feminist kind of media <laughs> output, right? It starred her uh, then wife, uh, his then wife, Jane Fonda, and it's sort of a hyper-sexualized um, subject, Barbarella is. So one thing that she constantly does is she's evoking her own sexuality from the perspective of, I guess, what would be called like the male gaze, right? She is both Roger Vadim and Barbarella in some weird way. I really think she sees herself as that, which is what I think is just iconoclastic and amazing about her intentionality with her dress, right? Is she's not really limiting it as just feminist. I'm just dressing like a man to break boundaries. She's got all these layers, right? I'm both, uh, you know, a sexy woman and an in-control man and this and this. And it's, it's so rich and complex and weird. And I think that she's given secondhand fashion a whole lot to go on and work with just with her own presentation, even if Agreed. we don't know what's going on behind the scenes. Exactly. And the simplicity. I think this is something that many people can emulate, which is really fantastic. Unlike what we saw in some of those 60s examples, which was a bit harder. Yeah, well, that's punk for you versus like that's <laughs> a vintage Edwardian hippie. <laughs> Completely. And now we're back to Kurt. And could you please now tell us about uh, Kurt's cross-dressing? Yeah, so I mean, I just see him as whether intentional or like knowledgeable or not, he is borrowing from this rich history all the way back to Evangeline Booth and certainly the Coquettes, this playing with the gender through secondhand, playing with class through secondhand, mocking his own background and his own identity and obscuring it at the same time. He was always really ambiguous about his own sexuality, even in his diaries, right? Whether or not he hadn't figured it out, didn't think it was relevant or important or, you know, whatever, right? It's, it's, and that comes across in his clothing. And I really love the yellow banana dress that he wears to the headbangers ball that he just, you know, said he picked out the ugliest thing he could find at the thrift stop shop, you know? Because the Headbangers Ball is, you know, this is also him making a comment about his music, right? He did not want Nirvana to be pigeonholed, right? They weren't heavy metal. They weren't, he wanted them to be, and, and that's why even that 1993 uh, um, 
unplugged performance. He plays a lot of like classic blues kind lead belly songs and Bowie. He's trying to say, no, I'm classic. I'm kind of bigger than this label of grunge or heavy metal or any of this. So he shows up at the headbangers ball, just, um, you know, wearing jeans under this hideous taffeta number here. And um, he's, he's mocking fashion as well as I think categorizations of music. I really think there's a dig in there and that he's doing that intentionally. Maybe I'm giving him too much credit, but I don't think so. I think you're, I, I read it that way as well. Definitely. <laughs> there was quite a bit of humor in many things that he did. Absolutely. And dress was always there, you know, and I don't, I just, this, this cover of request, I just think is sort of, I would have loved that dress when I was 14, I know. So it's just kind of the perfect thrift store grunge dress, no matter what sex you are, that it's, I just think it's a wonderfully well-chosen representation of grunge style. And the fact that he can wear it just as well as, you know, um, uh, Kathleen Hanna could have or something, you know, is, is, is tells you something about the fashion of grunge. Yeah, it does look fantastic on him. It fits really well. It's, it's very flattering. <laughs> and this is a really fascinating editorial that I know anyone who's interested in the history of grunge and its relationship to high fashion references and dissects and thinks about a lot. So can you explain a little bit about this Vogue spread grunge and glory? Sure. I mean, I remember when this came out. <laughs> and just being kind of gobsmacked by it because I'm sure, you know, I thought me and my friends were making all this stuff up and we were so creative. And then suddenly um, it's, it's high fashion, it's mainstream, it's expensive. Um, and it, it's interesting, the terminology here in Vogue, right? It's broken out of the clubs, garages, thrift shops. Like it's been trapped there, you know, it's been trapped at the bottom of the heap <laughs> and now it's emerged and we can all, it, it's kind of a reverse democracy in a way narrative, right? Now we can all have this fabulous grunge style. Um, you don't have to shop at Goodwill. <laughs> you you can, you know, wear Donna Karan and, and still be fashionable. So it's an interesting flipping of the script, right? Whereas you might think thrift stores are, have a democratic appeal. Anybody can go there. And, you know, many, many more people can afford it. It's much more accessible. Um, but it's not accessible to everybody is what this is saying, right? There are some people who feel like, no, I can't wear that stuff. As pretty as I might think some of it is, as cool as like the, some of the styles might be, oh, now I can wear it because um, I only wear designers or it has the imprimatur, you know, the stamp of approval of high fashion. Now I can get into it or admit that I'm into it. So I, I really think it's interesting how it's uh, revising democratic dress uh, implicitly. Absolutely. And the styling for this, which was done by Grace Coddington, I think is absolutely brilliant, regardless of your thoughts on grunge dressing or grunge crossing into high fashion. Just the fact that she was able to create these looks using what is typically this sort of straightforward high fashion, I've always found really interesting. Absolutely. And breaking the boundaries too, in like characteristic ideals of model beauty, right? Because the, the 1990s were, you know, the decade of the supermodels uh, in a lot of ways, especially in the US. And you see some uncharacteristically model-esque you know, people here and faces and images. And so I, I do think she deserves a lot of credit for how she's displaying these trends. I mean, I think they're gorgeous. I would really like, I really like the combat boots and burgundy print dresses at the top there. And I think that's it is a grunge, even though it was really, I always say it was a blip in high fashion at least. Oh yeah. Um, it really had such an impact on mainstream fashion and dress during the 1990s. I was in high school uh, during the mid to late 90s and it, I was in the Midwest. So, you know, it wasn't New York, but it was still very much a style then that was completely cool and accepted, you know, years after it had hit the runway 
ways. Um, and of course, it's made a few comebacks uh, in more recent years. And sometimes I walk around the FIT campus and see our students looking completely grunge. And I love it, but it also makes me feel old. <laughs> um, so it's really nice, again, to sort of come full circle um, with this moment. And I think a lot of what we're seeing with the 90s and the grunge revival is secondhand dress. Yeah, I mean, that's that's certainly been in the news a lot. And it's amazing to see how secondhand has emerged. The beginning of the pandemic, um, there was some anxiety. Were secondhand shops going to make it, right? Was secondhand clothing still going to be a thing? Of course, the internet to the rescue, not only was it still a thing, it became a much bigger thing. And sort of creative reuse and all of that, you know, there's been a lot of critique against the Gen Z and Depop and all that, but there's plenty of secondhand clothing to go around. <laughs> we don't have a dearth of clothing that's discarded in this country. And I, I really love the creative impulse that's behind the reuse of secondhand today, whether influenced by grunge or various other aspects. Well, thank you so much, Jennifer, for chatting with us today. This is absolutely fascinating. Uh, for anyone who has not read the book, I highly recommend it. It's so interesting. I think I told you, Jennifer, that I started to go over the book thinking I would just sort of skim things preparing for this talk, and then I just ended up rereading it because it's so good. <laughs> so it was really great to chat with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I can't wait to see your exhibit. Thank you.